Hello, hello, hello. Um, you're welcome to another wonderful time. Um, what are we going to talk about today? Um, something very important, very interesting. And um, depending on who you are, what you believe in, also very controversial. But we're here to dissect all issues. You know, like they say, nothing is new under the sun. Everything that we see every day or everything that we experience today as human beings has happened in the past. Maybe not in a particular way that we're experiencing it today, but in a very similar, slightly different way. So today we are going to talk about how do you resolve your issues, your civil matters, your social issues, your criminal issues. How best do you think it should be resolved? And then we're going to take all of that and then we'll compare it to how our ancestors in Africa resolve their own issues. You know, people think that, um, okay, some people think that um, the issue of legality or legal institutions or framework is very recent. No. Every civilization in history have put in place a legal framework that it uses to arbitrate over issues of dispute within the community. Without that, anarchy would rule. So you have to have like a set of rules and regulation, codes, so legal code that will help you to keep order, at least that will help you to rule or run your societies in a sort of uniform manner. So what did our ancestors do? What are we doing today? And how do you, or what do you think, or which system do you think is better? In your own estimation, I know we didn't live 100 years ago, but we've seen documentaries. We heard stories from our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. So we know exactly, or we have an idea of how they managed to run their own societies or how they dealt with issues. So, to do this, I'm going to tell you guys a very short story so that you will understand exactly what this is all about and where I am coming from. So I had this friend. Uh, we've been friends now for um, probably 15 to 16 years. Um, this dude is from Abombise in Imo State, Nigeria. So if you are from Mbise, you probably know where Abo is. So it's one of the three local government areas that make up the NBC clan. Um, so a um, few years ago, um, because we, 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 we've, we've known each other, we, we used to stay, actually, we used to stay in the same apartment back in the days. So until everyone, you know, as you get older, you begin to find your own path in life. Everyone moved out of the apartment. Everyone found, everyone decided to go their own separate ways. You know, seeking for more greener opportunities or greener pastures. Or you can also say um, life fulfillment. As you get older, as you begin to, you know, mature um, socially and financially, then what do you do? You stop sharing and then people move out. So a few years ago, but we kept in touch, like we'd be, we we remained very good friends. So we'd go out and hang out and chat and talk about life issues, just like normal friends would do. So he told me a story once of a land dispute in his um, kindred between his father and um, another family of the kindred. Like, um, if you are listening to this and you are not from Nigeria, then uh, let me just give you a little bit of a context. You know, in Africa generally, and then and, and where I come from, actually, uh, the extended family is a very, very, very important factor in uh, anybody's life. The extended family um, is very important. So it's not just you and your siblings and your father and your mother. You have your cousins, your cousins up to the, you know, three times removed, two times removed, even six times re removed. You all form part of um, a bigger kindred because you know in those days our ancestors would marry, one man could marry 10, 15 wives and then they would have a very large family. So. 
So they had this um, land dispute between his, um, his family and another family of the same kindred. So it's been ongoing for 50 years. In fact, it started with his grandfather. And then the dispute was passed down the generation. It was passed down to his father. And now his father is also getting old. He's, the guy is just the um, same age as me. So he has inherited this problem. So he would tell me about this issue from time to time. He would tell me that they've got this piece of pieces of land. It's not like a piece of land. It's not like a plot of land, like probably a few plots of land in the village that um, nobody farms there. Um, the, 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 the land is overgrown with weed. No one uses it because it's still being disputed. Like the rightful owner, nobody um, has been able to take ownership of the, of the land because of the history that um, follows it. So he said to me that um, the, the, this piece of land has been, they've tried to resolve the issue in their kindred. You know, normally in Igbo land, if you're having a land dispute, you don't run off and go to the police or go to court immediately. You call the elderly people in the family, the Indiche, the Ndinze. If you are when in another village, if you are even if you are born outside the village, like some of us, you can you can you can So they try to resolve this issue in the village. Um, in the kindred, for so many years, you know, they couldn't. Nobody wanted, uh, of the two guys who were, you know, jostling for the pieces of land, no one wanted to give in. So in my place, if the kindred are not able to resolve an issue, the next step or the next stage of um, trying to resolve it, the next stage of resolution will be the, the Igwe or the Eze, depending on what part of Igbo land you're coming from. That's the traditional ruler or the traditional ruler of the community. So they took the case to the traditional ruler. For so many years, the traditional ruler couldn't do anything about it. You know, you know how it is with um, some of these inherited properties, especially the properties that um, we are not properly gazetted over time, the properties like you inherited from your great grandfather. Usually there's no C of O, there's no legal edict that ensures that the, the, the rightful owner is um, very obvious. So usually in arbitrating over such matters, um, we, we only, you only your facts and evidence is only going to be derived from word of mouth. And the stories of the older people who are around, who witnessed when the issue happened and who heard stories from our ancestors, will be the ones giving evidence, will be the ones trying to resolve it, telling the stories of history, you know. But there are, there are no like paperwork or no formal way of resolving it like you would do uh, in the courts or like you would do in the police station whereby they will ask you for evidence, they'll ask you for C of O, they'll ask you for registrations, and, and you know, there was nothing like that. So the Igwe tried his best, but it didn't end there. So they took the matter to the police. You know, our Nigerian police, um, <laughs> such a matter, they're only going to fleece you. You just spend a lot of money for nothing. And then they will also hands off the case. So the case went to court. This case has been in court since 1975. My friend hasn't even been by me. And we, he, I, I don't think this guy, I don't think he was born in 1975. I think he was born way after 1975. He hasn't been born when this case went to court. So for, for, from 1975 to these days, about 45 years in court. And then you, you, you realize that if it, such a case has been in court for 45 years, and we all know that there are no evidence anywhere, no one can prove for sure, beyond word of mouth, that they actually own this land. You know, it's, it's, that case will never end. But now, here's the thing. When this friend told me about this issue, it was when he wanted to go to the village and build a house. If you're a full-grown Igbo man, if you're a full-grown Igbo man, you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. There comes a time in an Igbo man's life when you, you've become an adult, you've become financially stable, that you'd want to go and build a house in the village. 
You see, it's not like these houses in the village are like, it's, for, for as far as I'm concerned, they are worthless, they are valueless. But some certain sociological issues cannot be abolished. Unless if you want to become a person and ungrata in your, in your village, if you don't want to be respected. So it's not so much about an investment, it's more about, you know, assuaging um, the sociological demands and psychological demands of your, of your own environment. So in my village, if you don't build a house, if you're still staying in your father's house after, at, um, after some time, uh, people will use it against you. They will start talking about you in a bad way, like you're a, you're a waste, you're useless. You didn't achieve anything in life. So it's like a something that we use to show status, that we've arrived, that we are now grown men. Like in the community, if you're able to build your own house, you'll be considered, you know, even amongst your peers, even within the kindred, during so, such social gatherings whereby people are allowed to express their views on, on issues affecting the village. So if you have your own house, it adds to your status. So it's a must. You can have your investments all over Nigeria, but you need to go to the village and erect a house. So we do it anywhere. So this, my friend, wanted to build his own house. And in that part of Imo State, in that part of Ibo Lani Bisi, they have a very, very serious problem. The population density is very, very, the population is very dense. So the population density is out of this world. I think it's among, if not the most densely populated area in Imo State. Among the most densely populated areas in Imo State. If you go to Mbise. There's a lot of people living in a very, very, very small geographical space. So what happened? He wanted to build his own house. So he approached his father. He said, Dad, um, I think I want to start building a house now. And the father was like, okay, it's fine. But we have a piece of land, but it's still being disputed who the rightful owner is. So let's try to resolve it first. And then you can always come and do your thing. So you know what happens with money, especially if you're living abroad, if you are making that money or if the money is coming now, if you've saved up for a project, if you don't do it immediately, even generally, not just for people who live abroad, if you are planning to do something, something that is like going to be financially demanding, if you don't do it, if you've saved up for it, if you don't do it immediately, something else will come and take the money. It's natural. So my friend insisted, he said, Dad, but let's go and start doing it. He said, no, you can't. This case is still in court. So he came back to base. He was on holiday. He, he was holidaying in Nigeria. He stayed, I think, for one month. So he came back to base and he relayed this story to me. He told me exactly what has happened. So I asked him about um, if they've tried to resolve it through the normal route, you know, like the normal civilized um, urban, uh, what an, a civilized urban man would do it would be to go to the police, probably to go to the courts. He said, yeah, he's been there for 50 years. That's what my friend told me. I was like, wow, 50 years, more than 50 years, he said, yes. And he, like, he actually started with my grandfather. So jokingly, I wasn't taking it serious. I said to him, have you tried to resolve this issue the traditional way? Have you tried to, to at least in your village, he's from Chokoneze. Let me just name where he's coming from in Mbise. You have this um, deity called Alobaga. Have you tried to resolve this issue? using the legal, the traditional legal framework, probably it would end faster. Then he was like, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not allowed to do such a thing. In my family, we are Christians. We are not allowed to go to, to a shrine or to a chief priest or to, uh, you know, those kind of places. And we can only go to court or police or, or, to, or, to, or to whatever. I was like, what? But why? What's the problem? He said, no, I'm a, I'm, I'm a born-again Christian. My, father, my mother wouldn't allow that. My father is a knight of the church. Mm, my, my mother is in the CWO. He's in the, I was like, okay, fine. I understand all of that. Can you tell me the difference between this kind of legal means and this, the, the white-collar one that the British came with? These are just two cultures. So I don't know what you mean when you say that you can't go there because you're a born-again. He said, no, eh, this one has repercussions, there's evil spirit in it, I'm going to be hunted. I was like, no. You don't just, just, you just don't know how it works. You see, how I perceive these things, eh, 
if I have to go to an oracle to get justice, it wouldn't be based on the fact that that oracle is going to kill you. I don't, actually don't believe that it will kill you. It will be based on the fact that your fear of that oracle, I'm going to use it to get justice for myself. Because as African people, let's just be honest. If they take out the Bible, say take out the Quran, and take out um, a juju head, which would scare you more? If they present these three different um, um, religions or these two three different um, legal framework or um, conflict resolution issue or conflict resolution um, framework or apparatus, which would you fear as an African man? He said to me, no, I would fear the deity more than the Bible and the Quran. And then the, the, your, your, your adversaries, the family that you are into this dispute with, which do you think they would fear? They say, obviously, the date. Nobody wants to go to the date. I said, why don't you use this to your own advantage? Probably the truth will come out. You know, like I was saying it casually. I didn't take it. I've never been to a date. But I was being very pragmatic because, you see, human beings don't like to resolve issues peacefully. Sometimes human beings want to take, want to stress each other for something that could, could end in a two or three minutes. They want to drag it on and drag it on and drag it on and drag it on until nothing gets resolved. 50 years down the line. I was like, okay, fine. You have your options. You have exhausted the first one, which is to approach your kindred. Your, actually, it wasn't you. Your father actually did that one. It wasn't res resolved. You went to the traditional ruler. It wasn't resolved. You've been to the police. You've been to the court. Why don't you explore this last one? Why don't you just go there? Probably you don't even need to swear an oath. Probably it wouldn't even get to the, um, to the situation whereby you, you all would go there. Probably just by making a complaint there at the shrine, this your uncle who is fighting over this piece of land with you, or this other family is fighting over this piece of land with you, will give in. So that's the psychological push. The psychological undertone to it is that what we fear, we tend to respect sometimes. Just because by virtue of us being afraid of this shrine probably would say the truth. Why don't you use that? So I said it to him casually. He didn't take it. He was like, okay, it's fine. I will, I will talk to my father, but I'm not sure he's going to agree to that um, suggestion. I said, no, when, why don't you just give it a try? Why don't you just talk to him? See, because from where I'm standing, this case or this, this issue is not going to be resolved in the next hundred years. In fact, your children, in the future, your children are also going to get involved. When we must have all died and all passed away, your children are going to get involved. So why don't you try to resolve it now? I was like, okay, it's it's fine, I will try. I said, okay, but you know how it works. You need to make sure, your father needs to make sure that this piece of land or this piece of land belongs to your family. He needs to know his story. I was like, okay, it's fine. So after some time, he went back to the village. Now he's not telling me now. And then he spoke to his dad about it. Um, initially, his dad was very hesitant. He didn't want to go through with it. Um, but eventually, um, you know, when, when you're a father and then your, your son is now a grown man you know, and then now he wants to build a house, you, you, that's something that you'd want to happen during your lifetime. It's something of pride. It's something that will make you a very proud father. That you've raised a man who is now capable of uh, building his own house and something like that. He's capable of doing something with his, with his life. So eventually, the dad agreed. So they went to Alobaga in Chokone Zembize. They consulted the chief priest and everything. So it's just like filing a case in a civil court. Just like just the normal process, but like in the traditional way. So these other family that they were having this dispute with were invited. Plus all the elders in the, in the kindred. So the family went there. That this other family, like, like uh, the defendant and the, the accused and the defendant. So they all went there. Do you know what happened? This case of 50 years plus 
was resolved in less than 30 minutes. They didn't swear an oath. They didn't fight. They didn't quarrel. It was resolved in less than 30 minutes. You know, in an extended family, when these disputes come up, obviously going to have blocks. You have some uncle supporting you and then some uncles supporting your adversary. It's natural. Even in your family, you have your favorite people. So the old man who was supporting his adversary, that's my friend's adversary, when they got to the shrine, he was told to, he was the oldest man in the family. He was, um, the, 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 the chief priest there said to him, okay, now, old man, you, you, you seem to know a lot about this. You're older than everyone here. I mean, this thing started, um, when this whole issue started, I think you were the only one who was, who was alive. When the, when the issue started going to court and police, the initial time when it all started, you were the only one who was born. The old man abdicated. The old man who, was, who has been like cheering these other guys on for years confessed that he didn't know anything about the land, that he, was, he, didn't, he wasn't sure of how the land dispute started. He wasn't sure who owns the land. He was only talking based on the stories he heard. So he wasn't even sure. But he used to be the pillar of the case such that people would, 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 would what? People would do, would go to him seeking for advice with regards to that case. He was like what you would call the Okuchua, because he was the oldest man. But in front of this deity, he didn't have anything to say. He confessed that he, he wasn't sure of what he, like everything that he's been seeing for the past 50 years was out of a guesswork. He wasn't sure exactly of what he was talking about. So the guy, the family, the, the actual family who was fighting my friend's family over this piece of land, the, the, the deity asked them, okay, is this piece of land yours? Are you, are you willing to swear an oath that this piece of land is yours? They, 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 what you call, they capsided, like a droning ship. They said, no, we don't want to swear an oath. In fact, we are leaving this guy, this piece of land, these pieces of land, we are leaving it to, to my friend's family. They gave up in 30 minutes after 50 years of going to court. This issue was resolved in a jiffy in less than an hour. You wash their hands off this land. And you are telling me that Chinua Achebe's book, Things Fall Apart, has no value. You see what we should have done when the white man came to Igbo land? We should have taken his education, his technology, and some of the other good things that he came with and kept our legal system. You understand? Whether Maaloga Kubugi or Beluaga Kubugi is not even the issue. The issue there is the fear we have for these things. Whether the, the, the oracle is going to invoke an evil spirit on you or not is not even the issue. The issue is that the fear we have for them will make us tell the truth. You don't even need to get to the point whereby you need to go to the, to the, to the shrine. Just by mere mentioning of the name of the shrine or just by even imagining going there, you will tell the truth. Even these are politicians that we complain of every day. You know when they win elections or when they when you when they want when you want when we want to swear them into office, we come with the Bible and Quran, and then they swear after we they will start doing all sorts of nonsense. The looting spree will start, the underdevelopment will continue, they will start stealing the last couple in the till. Envisage we take these guys, imagine we take these guys to Alobaga. Imagine we take these guys to Alosho Kija, to the long juju of Arochuku to take oath of office, that if I touch public money, let this oracle strike me to death. Imagine what would happen. You know, perfection doesn't exist. I'm not saying that everything will become normal, that utopia is going, no. But I promise you, these instances of corruption will reduce. So sometimes I look at going to the police and the court as a waste of time. Because from my own experience, each time an oracle is mentioned in the case, that case tends to be resolved immediately. So I don't think our ancestors were stupid. 
their way of resolving civil, criminal, or even social issues was very solid. We should have kept those things. Even you watching me now, if someone says to you, I'm going to pray over our case, let's say you, you, you get into a dispute with someone, and then he says to you, I'm going to go home, I'm going to pray that the Holy Ghost fire will, will, will destroy you or whatever. And if that person says to you, you know what, I'm going to take you to an oracle in my village, which do you think will have effect in you? Like, how would you react to both situations? Honestly. So this, my friend's story, and the ones that I've heard that are very close to it, has opened my eyes somehow to see how our ancestors were able to live, you know, without a lot of crime, without a lot of wickedness that we, that we now have today. I mean, they had their own issues. But there were lines that you couldn't cross 100 years ago in Mbise. There are lines that you wouldn't cross 100 years ago in Obo. There are lines that you wouldn't cross 100 years ago in Achina, in Enuguku, in Inri, in Enugwagede, in Ihitoboma, in Omaya, in Ungwaland, in Amechi Dodo. In Nkano land, in Nike, in Ungo, there were lines that you couldn't cross. There were lies that you couldn't tell. Like, you know that if I, if, I, if I lie about this situation, I'm going to die. Even if you're not going to die, but the fear of the possible repercussion for lying would deter you from even telling the lie. So, after what, after my friend, after what happened to my friend, like, I was like, okay. Wow. Wow. Probably this is a very good way to resolve issues. Like I'm not saying if you have a, an altar session with someone, you should just go to a shrine. No, man. Come on. There are other ways to do it. I mean, dialogue helps. Sometimes you can even resolve these issues without involving a second party. Sometimes it works like that just by talking. So I'm not saying uh, out of every th little thing that happens, you should run off and go to a shrine. No, that's not what I'm implying. I'm just saying that we should try to resolve our issues amicably between ourselves. But if it doesn't work, if it gets to the point that we can't resolve it, we can't have a, a, a gentleman agreement and shake hands and say, okay, it's fine, it's resolved. There are options. If the court is not going to help us, if the police is not going to help us, Probably we should imbibe this habit of consulting our ancestral shrines, ancestral, you know, those things that you'll find in your village. We all have it in our villages. Probably if we normalize those ways of resolving issues, probably peace will reign. Probably people will begin to respect each other. Probably this, this insistence on lying over disputes, especially civil disputes in our rural areas, even in, 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 the, in the cities, would probably subside. So, what do you think? You want to go to the police? You think the courts are going to help you? Or do you think the African traditional way of resolving issues 100 years ago, 200 years ago, is the right way to go? Because we still have those things in our villages. We all know where they are. So, what do you think? Which do you think is better? I'm not saying go there, don't go there. I just told you my story. You make up your mind. Thank you very much for watching. Catch you again next week. Thank you.